marching forward with unity, with unity and power, and power for, your glory. for your glory. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let's praise sing. The Lord. I don't have much of a voice this morning, so you're going to have to help me. Okay. Ooh, no, praise the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Welcome our welcome everyone and um, at, 
also I will welcome our first time guests this morning. But we are so excited that you made it out on a very cold winter Sunday and so thankful for everyone that could be here this morning. And those that are visiting with us online, thank you so much for viewing in this morning. Maybe you needed to stay and keep warm or you couldn't get out. So we're so thankful that you are even uh, viewing this morning as well. All right, guys, you can stand back up as we get ready to go back into our time of worship. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kings will bow down. When every chain will break, as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee. So open up the gates, so open up the gates, be way before the King of Kings. Oh, the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord?
thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet I know the night will come to pass my heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough just keep me within your love and my heart will sing your
your promise. Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. counted on as we leave one year and go into another we can count on Jesus amen amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I want lost but now was blind but now I see it was grace that taught my heart and grace my fears relieved how pray just in that grace of you, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Come on. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed. Mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Aren't you thankful for that grace this morning? The Lord has promised good. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life. shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below shall be forever mine. Will be
On the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This bread is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, most things, when they get broken, are useless, right? I still remember my brother and I getting in a pillow fight in, uh, while my mom was doing piano lessons, and it was his fault. Charlie. And uh, he threw the pillow, and I ducked with my cat-like reflexes, and uh, the pillow hit my great-grandma's antique lamp and the, some kind of funky special glass and the globe of that shattered and I still remember my mom's tears and uh, I remember my dad sitting for hours with super glue trying to put what was broken back together again and uh, it was never the same. Most things when they're broken aren't as good as they were before. But Jesus has a way of taking broken things and making them better somehow. I don't know how he does that. He, he broke fish and loaves and he fed 5,000 people. He, he admonished the lady who broke her expensive alabaster bottle of perfume when the disciples were saying, what's she doing? What a waste. And Jesus said, it's not a waste. She is pouring out her ultimate devotion and sacrifice and worship to me. And therefore, it's an extravagant way of praising me. And then on the night that he was to be betrayed, Jesus said, I'm going to be broken. And how many of you can say today that because he was broken, you're better today, huh? Jesus takes broken things and makes them better. And because he was broken, we can be healed. Because he was broken, we can be forgiven. Praise the Lord. Today we thank you, Lord, for this bread that we hold in our hands because it represents a God who was willing to leave the perfection and the security and the safety of heaven and put on flesh and come and be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. You stepped into our place. You took our punishment. You were broken for me. Today, Lord Jesus, I rejoice that because you were broken, I'm set free, as we say. Today, because you were broken, I can be healed. And it's all because, Jesus, of your brokenness at Calvary. Thank you for your body. Let's partake of the bread together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pastor Charlie. You know, the scriptures say that on the same night in which he was betrayed, and Jesus took the cup and he said, this, this is, represents a new covenant which I give to you. And uh, that's what it's about. And as I was thinking about the blood of Jesus and, and uh, partaking of the, the, the cup, uh, as I look out my kitchen window, I look out across the field, and all I've seen here the last several weeks is just a white blanket that just covered the ground. And it was just as pure, as pure as white can be. And uh, it reminded me of a, a song we used to sing. And I'm not going to sing it for you. I don't want to put you through that. <laughs> but um, one of the references is, it says, How precious is the flow that cleanses Amen. white as snow. Amen. And I, that causes Jesus. me to think about the blood of Jesus. That when we're covered in the blood, regardless of who we are, regardless of what we have done, that when we're covered in the blood of Jesus and he looks down upon us, he doesn't see those old filthy rags that we were once clothed in or that we, uh, we carried with us. The only thing he sees is white garments that has been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. Amen. And so as we partake of this, this cup this day, just be thankful. Let your hearts be filled with thanksgiving for what the Lord has done for us. Praise the and Lord. And we partake of it realizing that our sins have been forgiven. And we are cleansed as white as snow. Praise the name Let of us Jesus. Take together. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Charlie, for serving with us today. Stand with me we, as we worship the Lord for one more moment or so together. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy.
Lord, you were the only one that could save us. You were the only one that could come and make us white as snow. You were the one who was broken so we could be forgiven. We bless your great name today. This is the great way to start a brand new year by blessing the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. I was, I don't know what you do during worship. Of course, I listen to the words and I try to focus on Jesus. And I found myself down there to this morning because I do this once in a while. I would like to praise God and I didn't get close, but I'd like to praise him as if it was my last time to do it on earth, you know, because you just never know, right? And he deserves the highest praise. And what if this was your last opportunity on earth to praise him today? How would you want to go out? Come on, let's praise him one more time together today. Praise the Lord. I bless you, God. You're worth everything to me. Thank you for your goodness in my life. Thank you, oh God, for all you've done for me. Thank you for health and for life, oh God. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my wife, Lord Jesus. Thank you, oh God, for your proven faithfulness to me over and over again. Thank you that there's no one like you in all the earth, Lord Jesus. And I bless your name, oh God. Help me this year to bless you more than ever, oh God. Help us as a church to honor you like never before. Oh, God, because you're worth it. You are worthy of our praise. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. You may be seated today in the presence of the Lord. Thank you to our worship team today and all of you for being here on a cold, another cold. We've had a few of them, haven't we? Wow. It has been a bitter cold stretch and, uh, but let me just encourage you a little bit today. It's supposed to be 51 degrees on Wednesday. That's going to be like going to Florida, right? I mean, just step out on your front porch and say, I'm in Florida. Just enjoy it, soak it in. I think it's supposed to maybe hit 60 on Thursday. and Whew, right? I mean, when you go outside and your nose holes hurt, you know it's cold. Right? You know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't talk about it in front of people like I just did. But you know when you breathed in, it hurt this week. And so we're looking forward to some warmer weather. Well, I never got over I'm not under the bondage of sin anymore. Well, I'm still amazed that Jesus would pay a debt I could not afford. I never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. Well, I still feel as much as when he first touched me oh yes well i'm still amazed well i'm amazed to know how far god would go to send a lost man free well i'm still in awe that he gave it all for an old sinner like me well i never got over that this king would shoulder my sins with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary still, still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, well, I'm still amazed. Amazed that this stranger would accept a manger in exchange for a kingly throne. Well, I'm still at a loss why he'd take the cross instead of streets of pure gold. Well, he's the only king who gave everything in exchange for a cold, dark grave. Well, I still love to ponder 
this God-given wonder. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. Well, I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. Well, I'm still in awe that he gave it all for an old sinner like me. Well, I never got over that this king would shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, well, I'm still amazed. Well, I never got over that this king would shoulder my sins with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Well, I'm still a man. Thanks, Josh. That's a great guy right there, singing a great song. And uh, we are privileged to have some just wonderful people on our staff. And Josh is one of them, hardworking, committed and uh, putting in extra hours, and I'm privileged to work with some really, really fine people. And Josh is right there at the top of the list, and so we're grateful for him. Many Sundays, he's out singing somewhere, and uh, not just local. I mean, it gets around. He was just clear down to Arizona a couple of weeks ago, and so he's a popular fella. And so, uh, well, we're excited to start a new series going into the new year. Many times people are thinking about things that they'd like to do differently, to change. Uh, We might call them the the old New Year's resolutions, ideas. Many times the people that set those things by uh, the second week have already stopped doing them. Uh, But the intention is, and at least the idea and the thought is, well, it's a new year. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to do some things differently, and I'm going to pay attention to some of the areas of my life that need to be improved, and in line with that, we wanted to kick off this series called Live Well. wanted to start the year with a series that helps people get healthy because our church, Trinity, is to be a place of healing and hope for people in our community, and so that thought and Jesus' words in John 10, 10 led us to do this Live Well series To kick off 2018, Jesus said these words, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full or to the maximum. One version says, I've come to give you life at its very best. And Jesus in that verse did not promise us a perfect life. How many of you have a perfect life? Right? You mean asking Jesus into your life didn't make all your problems go away? And we know that not to be the case. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I've often said that if becoming a believer meant all your problems went away, there'd be a line outside of every church 20 miles long, right? Everybody would want a piece of that. And so what's the benefit then? The benefit is when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll not leave you. You'll have somebody beside you constantly throughout life. And this is the difference when we go through problems, and we will because unless you've not noticed, this is earth, not heaven. This is a broken place. And when we see evidence of that brokenness, we're not alone. We've got a Savior, and God steps in and makes us have the best life possible. Jesus didn't promise us a perfect life because we live in an imperfect world impacted by sin, and bad things happen every day, even to good people. And it's hard. It's heartbreaking. It's hard for it to happen to you. It's hard to watch it happen to other people. How many of you have looked at somebody else and you've thought, that's such a good person, he's such a good man, he's such a good woman, they don't deserve this? Huh? We all have, right? Sometimes you've looked in the mirror and said, that's such a good guy. He doesn't deserve this. God, I'm trying to serve you. Why? 
And so Jesus didn't promise a perfect life, but he did say, if you'll make me your priority, then I'll help you to get the maximum potential out of this your one and only life. And so the Live Well Challenge is for anyone who would like to take Jesus up on his offer. In this imperfect world, I'd like to live my one and only life to its maximum potential potential. And so I encourage you, take the cards that the ushers have at the door on your way out and and talk to somebody, give them to somebody each week, a different theme. And here they are, the four categories that we're going to address all month long. Number one, your spiritual life today. Secondly, next week, relational, then resources, your time and your money, how to steward those so you get the most out of them. And finally, your physical and emotional health. How many of you know that holistically speaking, each one of those things is really spiritual in nature? They really are. And I'll I'll give you proof of that. If even one of those areas gets out of balance, it eventually affects some or all of the rest of those areas. For example, if you misuse your time and your money, it'll cause problems in your marriage. Right? So they they bleed up. And if it's causing trouble in your marriage, guess what? It'll have an impact on your spiritual life and your spiritual health. So we're an intricate creation made by God, so many different slices of us, and all of them woven together, and they all have impact on one another. Stress and conflict will create problems in your relationships or with your health. And so holistically speaking, each one of these subjects has an impact on all of us. The Bible teaches that paying attention to your spiritual health is the best way to keep the rest of you healthy. If you'll put God first, He will help you live well with your relationships. If you'll put God first, He'll help you manage and steward your time and your money better. If you put God first, He'll keep you healthy in your relationships and with your emotions. And here's a scriptural text for that, Matthew 6.33. Most of you can quote it. Uh, this is a different version of it here. God will give you all you need from day to day if you will live for Him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. You might have memorized it like this. If you know it, say it with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I love that verse. And I often will uh, summarize it differently. Put God first and He'll take care of all the details. I believe that. If you'll put God first, He said, I'll handle everything else. Your, Your only job, in fact, I've often said to people, when life gets complicated, go to the simple truths of Scripture. And here's the simple truth. If you put God first, He'll make sure other stuff goes well for you. Just honor God. I know it's complicated. I know it's overwhelming. Just focus on making God first. That one thing, just focus on that. Don't try to fix this and that and that and that. Just focus on putting God out front, and he will calm you, and he'll begin to supernaturally get involved in your life, and he'll give you a plan, or he'll put somebody else around you to help you get a plan, and God will begin to clear up the picture for you. I believe it. I've seen it happen over and over again. Today we're going to begin this series by focusing on our spiritual health. And then for the next three weeks, we'll be talking about how your spiritual health impacts the other areas because God cares about all of you. And He's committed to being there and helping you and helping the people that you love live their lives to their maximum potential. So it's a new year in which of these four areas... Do you and those that you love need the most work or most help? God offers supernatural and practical help to to help us live at peace with God. Maybe you know somebody, they're not at peace with God. They don't know God at all. And so that's the top priority for them. God helps us to have healthy, meaningful, fulfilling relationships. Maybe for you going into 2018, that's your top priority. You've got a relationship with a wife, a spouse, a son, a daughter, a mom, or a dad that's out of place. And it would really be a great thing for you to put at the top of your priority list, God, with your help, I want to help heal the relationship that's gotten fractured between me and dad. 
or between my wife and I? What do you need to help the most in to keep us right in our priorities? How many of you today, your time is way out of whack? I mean, there's no margin left for you or your money is messed up and you need to make it a priority this year to let God help you get that under control so you can sleep at night and you don't feel all this stress from getting out of balance. Maybe some of you need to take care of yourselves physically or emotionally and I guarantee if you don't take care of yourself emotionally it will have effect on your physical body and your physical health as well. Which of those areas And maybe you can think of somebody that really is out of balance in one or more of those areas. And I encourage you, take those cards, put them in their hands. Say, come and sit with me next week. It's going to warm up. Come to church with me and let's live well in 2018. Huh? You with me? People will come if you'll invite them. It works. Number one reason people go to church is because somebody they trust invites them. And so you think of somebody that needs help from the Lord, say, hey, listen, let's live well together this year. we got this new series, Come and Sit by Me, and let's make it a priority to be as healthy as possible going into 2018. I believe, how many of you partner with me today, that God would save somebody's marriage over the next few weeks? You think God's up to that? then would you join with me? Let's pray that God will heal a marriage, several marriages, several families. I believe that God's going to help some people get out of debt. I believe that God is going to help people improve their lives. How many of you believe that God could get a hold of somebody and it could literally save their life this year, right? How many of you would like to see some drug addicts get free this year? Why not this month right here? And if God could get a hold of their life, My chains are gone. We just sang it. I've been set free. We want to see people get free in Jesus' name. It starts by believing and then inviting and then pray. How many of you know when you invite somebody, you come to church different? You really do. First of all, you're hoping nothing weird happens. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, I hope everybody's, like, really good today, you know, because my, my boss is coming or, or whatever. You know what else you do? It gives you a spiritual stake in that service. And throughout that day, you're sitting there. You're not just observing. You're not just out there going, well, I'd give that song a 5 out of 10, you know. No, you, you go from having a scorecard to a participant, and you're out there praying, oh, God, get a hold of my friend today. Oh, God, speak to my boss today. I can't believe they're here. Oh, God, what an opportunity. I pray that you'd speak by your Holy Spirit into their life. It changes the way that you approach even coming to church. And so bring somebody with you, and let's get healthy together in 2018. So let's talk about how to improve your spiritual health. And I'm going to start by assuming that somebody's watching online. And thank you for joining and tuning in if you are. Maybe listen to this message that doesn't know God at all. And maybe you're watching and you're here today and you're not what you'd call a very religious person and maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you're watching and you're not even sure if you want or need a relationship with God. And so let's start with a couple really important questions. And they're there in your outline and on you version as well. If you have a smartphone, want to look that up. Why do I need God to live well? Is that really work? Is it really necessary? How does my spiritual health really impact my health and my quality of my life? Was Jesus really telling the truth when he said, and what did he mean if he meant it, or when he said it, that knowing him was the secret to living life to the full? I mean, is that reliable? And as a student of the Bible and as a student of people and life, The answer to the question, why do I need to know God to live well, is a great question to me to ask, and it's because knowing God gives us vital information that we all need for three critical things in life, our identity, our purpose, and our eternity. Knowing God is critical to understanding your identity, your purpose, 
and your eternity, all right? So before I tell you what the Bible says about those three things, it's important to take you back to Jesus' words in 10.10 because I only gave you half the verse. Let me give you the whole verse now. Jesus said, the thief, who's the thief? Satan, you know you have an adversary. You know you have an enemy that hates your guts. Every day when you get up out of bed, he's like, I'd like to do bad things to them. He's relentless about it. And Jesus verifies that by saying the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. How many of you like any of those three words? How many of you like anybody wanted to do any of those three to you or your family? And so understand the devil's not some like red-suited guy with a pitchfork and horns on his head at Halloween. I mean, he is your adversary, and he wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy everything that matters to you. And then Jesus says, on the flip side, I've come that you could have life and have it to the full. And so here's what we can learn from that one little short, skinny, but important verse from the Son of God's mouth we learn that there are two spiritual forces at work in our world every day, right? The forces of evil led by Satan himself, the thief, and the forces of good led by God, and Jesus was God come down in the flesh. And these two forces are constantly in conflict with one another until the future day when God will one day remove Satan from power altogether, bind him and banish him to hell for eternity. It talks about it in Revelation, like 19, 20, 21, if you're interested in, in reading about it, that he's going to be bound. And until that time, everybody that lives on planet Earth wakes up Listen to me today, not just to a physical atmosphere, but to a spiritual atmosphere that you cannot see with your eyes that's just as real. Okay, you need to understand this. Pastor Charlie mentioned looking out and seeing outside a blanket of white and you know you can look out your window and you can see there's trees and there's the old well and there's my car I wish I had a new one you can I mean you look out and you see things with your eyes but there is stuff going on that you can't see with your eyes that affects what you can see every day there's a spiritual battle that's going on you want some more proof of it turn on the evening news right and probably within the first five minutes, you're going to hear some heartbreaking stuff that will cause you to go. Have you ever watched the news lately and just gone, oh, my word, what's wrong with people? You ever do that? How many would agree with me that there is some crazy stuff going on in our world? Right? It is not normal for somebody to take a gun and walk into a schoolroom full of kids and shoot them. That says to me, that's verification that Jesus was right. There's a thief that lives to steal, kill, and destroy. And there's stuff that you can't see with your eyes that's going on out there that gets inside of somebody's head and heart and whispers crazy things to them. And they go do the unthinkable. And we watch it and go, what's going on? And I'll tell you what's going on. Jesus said what's going on. There's two forces at work in this world. Every day, the thief that lives to kill, steal, and destroy, and a God that wants to rescue you and help you and give you life to the full. I mean, murder and rape and suicide and mass shootings and people that are being convicted of child pornography and sexual abuse and terrorist attacks. And we watch these things. I don't know about you, but I know clearly there's something behind. There's someone behind these horrible acts. It's not normal. It's not Normal human behavior. Sometimes I'm amazed to kind of read back. On, I still remember doing a message years ago on Timothy McVeigh that blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma and all that collapsed. And man, you pull up his picture and he was the cutest little kid. 
He's somebody's son. He's somebody's grandson. And he grew up and he got exposed to some things that warped his mind and his heart. And he did something unthinkable. Jesus was telling the truth when he said, there's a thief ready to steal, kill, and destroy. And alongside of that, I'm at work fighting that, trying to give you life and life to the... I want you to live well. I want you to avoid the pain of sin. And we all have pain, but how many of you know that sin will pile on the pain? Okay? Even believers have pain because it's a broken place. But when you sin, you unnecessarily pile on the pain that you don't need. And so three things that answer the question, why do I need to know God to live well? The first one is that God's the secret or the 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 secret to knowing your identity, right? Knowing God answers some critical questions about your personal identity, about where you come from, okay? So my birth certificate, I have it in my drawer at my house somewhere, and it it tells me, if I read it, that I came from Wendell and Jan Wilson, that I was born in Woodward, Oklahoma, at Woodward General Hospital on July the 23rd, 1962, send birthday presents to 12 Matthew Drive, Fairmont, West Virginia, Biologically speaking, DNA tells me that I'm a product of, that I come from Jan and Wendell Wilson. An X chromosome from mom and a Y from dad made me a boy. But the name on your birth certificate is not all that there is to know about your identity. Genesis 126 says, God says, let us make man in our image. This is God speaking. In Genesis 2, 7, and God formed the first man from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed the first breath of life into him, and the man became a living being, and it doesn't end there, okay? That was how he made the first man, and you might say, well, yeah, he's the first man, but what about me, right? God's still involved in the making of every human being. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us. And we are His. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. Powerful verses of Scripture. Lord, You made my whole body. You knew all about me while I was still in my mother's womb. And Lord, I praise You. You made me an amazing and wonderful way. And You watched my bones grow while my body took shape. And You watched my body parts grow. And You watched me every day. Acts 17 God gives everyone life, breath, and everything they have. From one man, God has made every nation of humanity to live over the earth. What does all this mean? It means that you didn't just come from your mom and dad. You come from God. That's amazing to me. Your mother and father's names are written on your birth certificate. God's name is stamped on your heart. And you can be identified by your parents' DNA, but God also identified you by stamping something of His own image into your life. And that is so important, and every human being needs to know that. You are not just a product of your mom and dad. Your daddy might be in jail. He might be dead. He might be a drug addict. Your mom might be strung out on heroin. Listen, that's not the only place you come from. You come from God. You have a heavenly Father that loves you, and He can clean up this situation and rewrite the end of your story. This is who He is. Some people desperately need to know that they're more than the product of their environment, more than the product even of their parents and the way that they're raised. There's heartbreaking stories out there about the way that some people were raised or not. Some people were raised by the streets. And they need to know that there's a God that loves you and you come from him and he is the source of your identity. You don't have to be a victim of society or the negative surroundings that you grew up. You have a choice. 40 years old, yeah, you came from this. You're a product of that, but you have a choice. You don't have to live the rest of your life a drug dealer or a pimp or a liar or a cheater or a thief or a fake or a failure. If any man be in Christ, he's a new person and the old passes away 
away and you get a brand new start. No matter what has come to identify you up to this point, you're watching at home, hear me today, no matter what has come to identify you, up, I don't care what kind of title, how negative it is that's been hung on you or that you hang on yourself, you need to know, everyone in the world deserves to know that you are a child of God. God's DNA is in you. And the thief wants to steal that identity and God wants to restore it. This is why we've got to tell a story so that you know where you come from and you can live well and you can look in the mirror and hold your head up and say, you know what, I may be broken. I may have come through so much pain and stuff, but you know what, there's hope for me because God is my Father. He loves me when nobody else does. Knowing God is the secret to knowing your identity. And secondly, it's the secret to knowing your purpose. Knowing God answers critical questions about why am I here? What is my purpose on this earth? And if you don't answer that question, you will waste your one and only life or at least big chunks of it. Because God has a unique purpose for every one of your lives. And it's more than your occupation. Sometimes we just... Make a living but what, but so that we can live a life. You have to have some money to, to pay the bills. But what is it that gives you joy? What is it that makes your heart beat faster? What is it that God has put you here to do? If you don't find it, how tragic to get the end of your life and look back and say, I wonder what it was. Did I ever really get to? You know, I had a dream in my heart one time that I felt like God spoke to me at a camp when I was 16, 17 years old. I never did that thing. That's why we're preaching this message today because I don't want you to get to that place and look back and say, I, I wonder what if. I wonder if I had just pursued that dream that God put in my heart. What might have happened? How might my life have been different? How might my family's lives have been? How might the world have been different if I had done what I felt God called me to do? We learned regarding our personal identity that we were made by God. If you had a label attached somewhere to you, it would not say made in China. It would read made by God. So we were made by God with our identity, and when it comes to knowing your purpose or what on earth you're here for, we were made for God. That's part of the reason you were alive. You were made to bring God pleasure, and in knowing Him, He would bring pleasure back to you. Listen, God never, if you study God, you will find that God never does anything accidentally. Uh, oops. Oh. Well, that, I guess that worked out all right. God never has one of those kind of things where he's like, I guess that worked out all right. I didn't see that coming. No, God always does whatever he does on purpose. Every time, all the time. He is a purposeful creator. Nothing he does is an accident or an afterthought or a mistake. And therefore, every person God made is designed on purpose. You, there are accidental pregnancies, but there's no accidental people. God has purpose. for your, You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. I don't care how you came into this world. There's purpose for you from God. And the purpose or reason that you are alive is, one, so that you could know your Creator, so that you could know His love. God made you so that he could love you, and he hopes that at one point in your life, you will choose to love him back. That's why he made you. I mean, the thief does not want you to know that, that you were made by God and for God, and that one of your big purposes for being alive and breathing is so that you could get reconnected with the God that made you. And when you do, man, it's like pieces begin to fit together, and you understand, here's why I'm here. And some people die never knowing or believing that God loves them. How sad. Not only did God create you for the purpose of being loved by Him, 
But because he loves you, he also created you to accomplish something very specific and uniquely purposeful during your lifetime. God's got a plan for you. Your life's purpose, the reason that you're here, God who always does things on purpose, he's got a plan for your life. And we read that over and over again. One of my life verses, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you, you, put your name in the blank, hope and a future. I've got a plan for you because I'm a God of purpose and I do things on purpose and you're on purpose and I've got something for you to do while you're down here walking through this earth. How many of you have seen people that they didn't live to 25 and it seems like they got more done for God in 25 years than some people did their whole life? Why? Because they, they, they somehow in those 25 years, they got a glimpse of who they were and why God had them here. And man, they lived their life to the full. I've seen people go out early from cancer and things like that. And we mourn them because it feels like in their short life, they lived life to the max. I don't know, sometimes knowing you're dying makes you live better. But in reality, are you with me today? We're all dying. So you better live. Because you don't know what tomorrow holds. So you better hug the people that you have to hug. And you better live your one and only life. And you better stop wasting time and enjoy every breath that you take. And you better be getting busy about God's dreams that he put in your life. Because nobody else is going to make them happen for you. Purpose purpose. I've got a plan for you. How about Ephesians 1.11? It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ, he had his eye on us and he had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he's working out in everything and everyone, end quote. Question, how do you know when you found it or when you're doing that thing for which God made you? And one the answer, there's a deep sense of personal fulfillment. I mean, it's like you, it, it, it pushes your buttons. You're like, you know what, I'd do that for free. I'd do that all day long, every day if I could. Man, that makes me feel so alive. But more than that, so it comes with this sense of spiritual fulfillment. For that to happen, though, you have to be doing that thing with God's help and for God's glory. Because you can do lots of nice things in the world. But when you do something for God, it lasts forever. And if you're doing it with God's help and for His glory, it usually benefits other people. Because God, if you haven't noticed it, this, He's crazy about people. That neighbor that bugs you, God loves them. That person that cut you off in traffic and gave you the one-way signal, God loves them. Have you, have you done this before? Have you, have you caught yourself before? You've been at the mall or somewhere. Not this one because there's nobody over there. But, I mean, you've been over at the, and you've been somewhere. You're at a ball game or something and you see somebody and something and you go, oh, man, I don't like that. What were they thinking when they got that hairdo? Or, you know? Maybe worse. I mean, maybe some real judgmental thought came into you. Look at all those tattoos and stuff. That's, you know, they're filthy. And here's what I try to remind myself when those kind of thoughts pop into my head about anyone. Sometimes I look at people and go, I don't understand. But God loves that person. The person I don't understand, the person I, I'm like, I don't get where they're, where they're going, where they're thinking. God loves him. I'm, so I'm telling you, when you get doing God's purpose for your life, one of the ways that you know it is it's incredibly spiritually fulfilling and it usually benefits other people because God didn't just give you something for your own benefit. Here's the joy, is watching somebody else's life get turned around. <laughs> There's the payoff. I'm telling you, Pastor Ray, I never get tired of that. There's days I get tired of ministry. There's days I get fed up with people. 
There's days sometimes you want to quit, but you know what I never get tired of? I never get tired of seeing Jesus do something in somebody's life. I never lose the thrill of watching somebody with tears rolling down their face get hope, Matt, back in their life again. And you're like, you know what? Jesus is real. And there's the proof of it right there again because he just got a hold of that person when nobody else could. And look what he's doing. And when he turns a life around, when God uses you, to do something like that, man, it is priceless. It's like that commercial, you know, for the credit card. You know, you can buy this, you can, this, priceless. Watching God use you to impact the eternal destiny of someone else, priceless. And you'll stand before Jesus someday, Tyler, and, and, and maybe those people will walk out in front of you and say, just wanted to see, you remember this guy? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he got saved because of you. And it'll never, you'll never forget it. I don't care how much fame or money or success comes with doing stuff for yourself. You never get that kind of feeling out of it. And if you want to live well, you need to learn to live with the understanding that your life is a gift from God. You don't deserve it. It was given to you. And the best thing you can do is give it back to Him so He can use you to accomplish things that don't just last for a day or a week or a few years. They last forever. Only God can do that. He made you. He built you. He put you here for that purpose. And man, do I want you as your pastor to know that kind of fulfillment in your life. Man, I'll celebrate that with you all day long, every time, over and over again. And the third thing is that knowing God and our spiritual life speaks to our eternity. Just talked about how what you do for God lasts forever. Let's talk about forever. That's the third thing that answers the question, why do I need God as you're watching at home? Why do I need God to live well? Maybe this is the biggest one of all. Of all the living creatures that God has made, and he's made millions, right? You, man, woman, we are the only thing that God created that ever asked the kind of questions that we've been talking about here this morning. Where do I come from? Your goldfish never asks that question, I'll guarantee you. A hippo, you know, you, you name it. Nothing else that God made has the capacity to say, why am I here? What is my purpose? Where did I come from? Here's a big one. What happens when I die? Does it get any bigger than that? Right? Only mankind has the intellectual capacity and the spiritual capacity to ever think of, let alone grapple with such huge questions. And a human being is not just flesh and blood. We are also soul and spirit. That's what separates us from everything else that God has made. We were hardwired, if you will, with a connection with our Creator. We were born with a built-in God sensor, an eternal indicator system. How do I know? Ecclesiastes 3.11, the smartest guy that ever lived, said, Solomon said this, God has set eternity in the human heart. There it is. God hardwired you to think about eternity. God built into you in an internal sensor that lets you know there's some bigger reason for your life than just living 50, 60 years and stepping out. Something built into us says there's more than living and dying, and the Bible verifies that from cover to cover because it talks plainly and clearly, and it describes a life beyond this life, and it calls it this, eternal life or everlasting life, life without end. This life is just the pregame warm-up. This is the dress rehearsal before the real production. Most of your living is going to take out place out there in eternity. Your forever death is not your termination. It's your transition into eternity. So there are eternal consequences to everything that you do. Rick Warren wrote it in The Purpose Driven Life, quote, to make the most of your life, you must keep the vision of eternity continually in your mind and the value of it in your heart. Only a fool would go through life unprepared for what we all know will eventually happen. I set 
along with my wife and some people from the church at Bud Irvin's uh, mother's funeral. We've had several people that have had loss starting the new year. Dale Dazelski's dear mommy passed away, and, and uh, uh, Larry Williams' uh, mother passed away, and unexpectedly, I think the first day of the year, Bud Irvin's mother collapsed, and they'd just been with her for Christmas, and Bud did a phenomenal job of presenting the gospel and doing his own mother's funeral. I was so proud of him. But I sit there like I have at so many funerals, and I looked around at me as he did. He talked about God, and he talked about eternity. I thought, there's nothing like a funeral to make you think about your mortality. Everybody in there is going, that's going to be me someday. And I can't predict how or when or am I ready for that? That's huge. That's such a huge question. It's hard to live well if you don't know you're ready to die. So Matthew Henry said it ought to be the business of every day to prepare for our final day. And all three of these important issues that are so critical for us to live well, our identity, our purpose, our inborn understanding of eternity are found in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have an identity and a purpose, but if they're not centered in God, that it's unlikely that you'll spend your eternity with Him either. And I like to watch these documentaries and things like that, you know, about people. Sometimes their, their stories are just sad and tragic and I remember watching one about John Belushi and Chris Farley, incredibly talented, highly successful comedians of Saturday Night Live fame who both died of drug overdoses at the young age of 33. Their identity, comedians. They made the whole world laugh, but they died of a drug overdose. The way they died was anything but funny. And they had another identity, drug addict. And it cut short their purpose and their God-given identity. And God only knows where they spend their eternity. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you can have life to the max. How do I get to know God then? If he's so important to living well. Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to God except through me. Now the world will tell you all kinds of things, and they'll look at you and say to you, as a, a believer in Christ, are you that narrow-minded that you think that Jesus is the only way to God? And here's my answer. doesn't matter what I think. I just live by what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and nobody gets to God but through me. And I live my life based on that. You have to decide. It's your choice. But I believe he was the son of God, and that what he did on the cross, and especially the way he got up after that, proves it. Right? And I put all my chips in this, that he's the one that died so he could raise me to life eternal because he said so. He said so. He said it in John 3.16, didn't he? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have... What was the words before that? Whoever believes in him. He didn't say Allah. He didn't say Buddha. He didn't say whatever version of religion you want. Here it is again. Jesus was very narrow-minded. Some people will look at you as a Christian and say, you're really narrow-minded. No, I'm just trying to, I believe what Jesus said. And he said, whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. I'm not going to argue with you. This is just what I believe. This is where I put my eternity in belief in that, the person, he goes on to say, who does not believe is already judged. Why? Because they've not believed in God's one and only Son. Romans 10, 9, Paul said, here's how you know God. If you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved from the punishment of sin. So let's stop right now and let's pray. If you don't know God, Based on the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart, God can move into your life right now. That's never happened. It can happen right now. For you in this room, 
Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God's in this place. The God who made you, your identity, your purpose, your eternity, it's all in Him. If you want to know you're right with God, if you want to know that you're headed for heaven, Jesus just told us how. You, know, you go to God through me. You get to know me by saying a prayer where you say what you did on the cross was more than enough to save me. If you've never prayed a prayer like this before and you want to do it right now, head bow. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. Anybody in the room today that says, I'm going to pray that prayer right now. Right now, I'm going to pray it with you, Pastor. Anybody as I look across the room? I want to know I'm right with God. You can do this at home right now. You can say a prayer like this. God, save me. You are the way to God, and I'm not going to look for alternate routes. You said it's you, Jesus. And so I put all of my hope and my trust in you. You died on the cross for a reason. And that reason was me. And I confess my sins. Forgive me. Come into my life in Jesus' name. Amen. That's how somebody becomes a follower. That's how you get saved. That's how you answer that question about your eternity. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to meet you after the service. Plug you into one of our starting point groups. Let me wrap it up. Once I know God, how do I keep getting closer to Him and taking care of myself spiritually, all right? Think of God today in closing as your spiritual doctor. Before you leave the place today, God's going to give you a prescription for spiritual health. You ready? Brand new year. You ready for the prescription for healthy spiritual living in the new year? Here's the first one. Here's what Dr. God orders if you want to take care of yourself spiritually. Number one, read and follow the commands and advice in God's book. You're like, I knew that one. Okay, just do it. That's the prescription. How many of you have also gotten advice from your doctor and you've not done it before? All right? If you want to know me, if you want to be healthy spiritually, thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Your word, God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. All of those things happen because you're stuck your, your nose in the book and you're reading God's promises to you. Go to, if you've not done it before and you've got a smartphone, you need to download before you leave the day the Version app and there are some phenomenal Bible reading programs right there for every day. I mean, excellent. Take you through. You can do Old Testament, New. You can do a combination. Dr. God would say, if you want to live well spiritually, read my word every day. Secondly, Talk to me. God, this is how, God, how, how you live well, spiritually. You got to talk to me, God would say. We got to keep the lines of communication open. We call it prayer. And 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually. And I challenge you, like one of the phone commercials this year, find how you can pick up minutes with God. All right? When you're driving down the road, turn off talk radio and talk to God right? Turn off sports and talk to Dr. God. Challenge yourself to always be thinking about him and know that he's right there and he's waiting to hear from you. Wherever you are, you can talk to him. This is the way you stay well spiritually. Third, you listen to and obey, add that part, God's voice. How many of you have heard God tell you to do something before and you didn't do it? Me. Don't just listen to, obey. Do, James says, what God's Word says. Don't merely listen to it or you'll fool yourself if someone listens to God's Word but doesn't do what it says. He's like a person who looks at his face in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. Don't just hear it. Do it. Another one, it's the way you grow spiritually in the new year. You worship God. Worship is not just something you do on Sunday morning set to music. Worship is a thought. It's an attitude. Every time you choose to think of God and to say, God, I love you, that's worship because that's one thought you didn't have to give him. So God loves it. The first act of worship in the Bible is when Abraham went to lay down his son Isaac in absolute obedience. Let us go up to that mountain and worship. Worship is absolute obedience to God. And God looks at that and says, look how much they love me, man. 
Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is God's prescription for your health in the new year. How many of you know that God has more for you than what you've currently settled for? And the Holy Spirit, Jesus promised you this to you, out of your inmost being will flow rivers of living water. I've got so much to give you that it'll flow from the begin, middle of you out up over the top. And that is the Holy Spirit pushing out competing thoughts and attitudes and exposing strongholds and supernatural power of God flowing and working through your life. And it ignites your passion for God and increases your godly courage. And man, I'm going fast because I just looked at the clock. All right, serve others is another one. This is God's prescription for you. You want to have a great life in 2018? Then find somebody and meet a need. Serve someone in Jesus' name. The Son of Man, Matthew says, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If it's what Jesus did, it's what you should do. He took off his outer robe and he knelt and he washed their feet and he said, this is the model, guys. Even as you've seen me serve you, you go serve the world. Serve the world in my name. It's in giving that we receive. When I lead someone to Christ, when I make the effort to serve and give to others, I see the spiritual results in their lives and in their eyes, and it inspires me all over again and reminds me Jesus changes people's lives. And last, here's your prescription for spiritual growth. Get around some believers who also want to grow Somebody said, man, if you want to stay on fire for God, get around the hottest coal you can and sit right up next to it, right? I mean, you get some people that love Jesus and you more than you and say, can we camp out together? Can we just stand side by side? And I'm telling you, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I heard somebody say, every person needs three people in their life. They need a Paul, a mature believer that knows more than them, has been places they've never been. They need a Barnabas, a peer-level believer that's kind of on the same plane with them, that's like a friend to them. And they need a Timothy. They need a younger believer that they're investing in. I challenge you this year to find those three people, a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. And one of the best places to find them is in one of our groups. And we have some amazing groups in the bulletin. You saw a list of them today. And uh, I want Michael Shreves to join me in closing today. I'm just going to ask him three questions, and we're going to pray, and we're going to leave. Michael Shreve and his family come almost every week here. He is an awesome guy. I'm going to hand you this mic, and Mike's going to help me by talking to me a little bit. Actually, we'll sit on these stools real quick, but don't get too relaxed because I told him we're getting ready to leave. And I got three questions that I'm going to ask Michael to help you understand the importance of being in relationship in one of our life groups, one of our uh, discipleship groups. You're in one, you started in a starting point group, it transitioned to a life group, and tell us how you got in one of those groups. Well, looking back now, it was pretty awesome. Um, you called me out of the blue, never met you, and uh, invited me to go to a starting point, and uh, hung up, and be honest with you, I was like, man, that is not for me. <laughs> You know, kind of a little laid back, and I didn't think I would enjoy getting with a bunch of guys and, and really uh, uh, sitting around and, and listening to what they had to say. Um, it's kind of funny, because my son, in the same week probably, was uh, invited by Dell Zilski, yeah. and uh, we were talking after hung up the phone with you, and he said, uh, yeah, he said, I was invited also. And I thought, man, what a challenge to me. You know, my son was invited, and he said, if you go, Dad, I'll go. So, actually, I said, uh, where are you comfortable going? And he said, with Dale. So, <laughs> so look at that. I got trumped by Dale Dazelski. Uh, um, and uh, Anyway, it was, it was a good opportunity, um, a blessing, really, you know, for to sit down and, and be able to go to a group with my son. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. Um, don't regret a bit of it. That's incredible. And I was so proud of Dale because I, I, I ask you, and you're like, you know, uh, yeah, thanks for asking, Pastor, but somebody already asked us. <laughs> and I'm like, that is great. And they joined what I, we call our, our Disney group, Skip and Dale's group. <laughs> and uh, they got in there. And tell us a little bit about what's, what's been the best thing about being a part of that group together with your son. Well, it's, it, you know, it's good because it's like a round table. You know, you can come in and sit down, talk with other guys, and there's not a right answer, there's not a wrong answer. 
uh, you, you get encouraged, encouraged. And that group has grown to about 14 guys yeah. now, from what I understand. It's yeah. getting so big that we're going to need somebody like you to take half of it and lead it. Uh, it's a tremendous thing. And so it's been really helpful to you in your Christian walk then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so last question, we've asked you how you got in a group, what's the biggest takeaway or thing that it's meant for you, and I just think it's so incredible that your son and you are getting that experience together, and I commend you for being a part of that. And the last question is, for the sake of some guy that's sitting out here going, you know what, I don't get it, I think that's sissy stuff, why would I want to go and sit around with a bunch of guys and in a room and talk about spiritual stuff? Talk to that guy from your heart just for a second in closing and sell him on being a part of one of our groups. Just uh, encourage you. You know, step out in faith. I uh, encourage you to, to join a group because don't be like I was initially, and that's nah, not for me, you know, a little backwards, gun shy. It won't benefit me. It will. And it's, you know, I look forward to it every week. Uh, I'm, I'm, I believe my son does. I hope he does. He's right there with me. And, mm-hmm. and it's, a, you know, it's a father-son thing for us. Uh, I don't hunt. <laughs> He's the hunter. And we're not out in the woods together, but we're doing that. And I think that's, uh, that's an investment that we both are investing in our lives to get encouraged from other guys and, and the Word of God. And what do you see happening, not just with yourself, but with other guys that are in there? Oh, I, I see guys getting more strength and just build up being in the group and, and sponging off of each other. Yeah. You know, sometimes one week they may be down, another guy may be up, and vice versa. I, I've seen this dy- dynamic happen in leading groups before that sooner or later guys get to know each other and they know what's really, and they'll, they'll say, hey, encourage each other. I've seen guys at times as they get to know each other go, oh, you don't want to do that, man. You, you can do better than that. And this is one of the powerful things is iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Absolutely. And so I'm sure you've seen that happen in your group where guys will step up and say, you can do better than this. Yep. And that's great. Well, man, I'm so proud of you for leading your family and for you and Christopher going to a group. And I'll let you slip back down to your seat. Everybody give a hand to Mike Shreves. Great guy. How long has it been, Christian, since you were excited about Jesus? I mean the kind of excitement you couldn't hardly wait to get out of bed in the morning. See what God's going to do today. And, and I'm telling you this, and you know it to be true. If things have gotten boring between you and God, it's not God's fault. Right? Because he's awesome. He's as awesome as he ever was. And so how do we close this thing? Let's stand together. God's listening right now. It's your chance to say to God a prayer before we leave this place. Is there a hunger? Is there a desire in you to know God more? I challenge you to pray it out before we leave this place right now. There's not big fancy music. There's not a bunch of stuff going on right now. But God's listening for your voice right now. And sometimes the feelings follow. So don't just go off of feelings. Pray a sincere prayer. See your prayer from your heart, something like this. God, I want this to be the best year with you and me that I've ever had before in my life. Oh, God, I want you to do something through my life and in my life like you've never done before. God, I refuse to live a boring, average life. Pour my life out for your glory. You ready? Come on, let's pray together. God, all over this place, people that love you and are wanting to love you more are talking to you from their hearts, and I'm just going to do it right here while they're doing it. God, I love you. I thank you for every year of my life I've gotten to live for you and to serve you, oh God. I'm grateful for all the wonderful things that you've done in my life, but God, I don't want to waste another second of this life, this year, these moments. I don't know how many more years I get, oh God, on this planet. And so, God, let me live my life full tilt for Jesus this year. Oh, God, let me lead this church with every ounce of strength and anointing and passion and energy that you can give me because, God, I don't want to just live an average, boring life. Oh, God, I want to live the maximum life that you promised I've come, that you could have life, have it to the full. Help me to live, help me to breathe deeply every breath. Oh, God, help me to love 
like I've never loved before. Oh, God, help me to pour out every ounce of energy and strength I have for you, Lord Jesus. Help us as a church, oh, God. I beg of you today, don't let us be normal. Don't let us be average in our following after you. Help us to follow after the Lord this year with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, oh God, because we believe that you really can see heal marriages. We believe that you really can set drug addicts free, oh God. We believe you really can turn a person's life. We can't do it, Jesus, but you can. And so we obligate ourselves to you on this first day of the year. And we say, oh God, would you help us? Would you fill us with your spirit today, Lord Jesus? Would you pour out of yourself into our lives so we can be poured out for your glory into others? Thank you for the reminder today that we come from you, that you've got a plan for our lives, and that in you our eternity is set, Lord Jesus. Help us to live with purpose for the King. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Stay warm. Come back next week as we'll talk about relationships. Don't just come back. Bring somebody with you. Next week, prayed up, ready. Let's make a difference. Let's live well. Praise the Lord.